Africa, hopeless, corrupt, dysfunctional, just not a place to do business. But suddenly, everything changed. Suddenly, Africa is the place to be, and foreign investment is flooding in, and foreign powers are coming back. And that's why we've come to Africa. When the global business media is suddenly interested, when even the economist, the neoliberal Bible of free trade and free markets changes their forecast from hopeless to hopeful, somebody should ask the question, hopeful for whom? So people died for the cause of Africa, of course, it's independence. Yeah. There have been attempts at establishing democracies. But in the end of the day, what we see is the French are there and expanding. The Americans are there and expanding. The Chinese are there expanding like hell. But where are Africans from those challenges that we're talking about? Are we going to back to the same old historical no, maybe. events? Most of our growth, you see, we are talking about 6% GDP per annum and those kind of stuff. But they are coming from mining. They are not really trickling down to the ordinary yeah. person. Yeah. They're so coming from where? From mining, mining. sectors, basically. Yeah. We are, from we are natural resources. Natural resources. Yeah. You go to, I go to my home village, and it's the same as it was um, 10 years ago. Your home village where? Um, in Botswana. It's about state priorities. They don't even care about the masses when you are talking about these deals. You come to certain countries, all state enterprises now have been privatized because it gets the state or the bureaucrats something in their in pockets. Return. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like and, and in the end, they are not, they are not so providing any, any opportunity so for the youth. So there are lots of so like, unemployment think, in think, Africa no, now. When I, when and I people think, no, but when want I think to travel things like... out of Africa because things are just not working. For centuries, Africa was treated like a chessboard by competing global powers. But for a moment, about half a century ago, it seemed that there was a sliver of hope. That somewhere between the darkness of colonialism and the horrors of an emerging Cold War, that popular movements were winning independence, taking matters into their hands. Africa was rising. But then the Cold War killed the dream. In Moscow and Washington divided the continent into new spheres of influence. Proxy wars plunged the continents into civil war. But two decades after the Cold War, it seemed that Africa is rising again, that investments are flowing in. We need to ask the big question, and we need to ask it in Africa. Are Africans at last taking matters into their own hands? Or is this just another scramble for Africa? The journey starts in Kenya. Our first stop is its capital, Nairobi. Nairobi, by all African standards, is a young colonial city. It was built on the railway towards the port of Mombasa. Today, Nairobi is buzzing. It's the financial and trade hub of East Africa. You'll see trucks and cranes everywhere, developers at work, except they're not from the West. They're from the east. China is now Africa's biggest trading partner. In just 10 years, China's trade with the continent has grown from 10 billion to over $200 billion. At least 2,500 Chinese companies are operating in Africa. And more than a million Chinese nationals have moved here to do business. 
In Kenya, Chinese companies are visible everywhere, but they are remarkably camera shy. We were chased off this construction site and were turned down by dozens of Chinese firms before we found a businessman who was eager to speak with us. Kenya and Africa is a, you know, is a hopeful land and uh, is uh, in the uh, early stage of taking off. So we believe there are a lot of opportunities. When Gao Wai moved to Kenya 10 years ago, he says there were only a handful of Chinese living here. Now there are tens of thousands. The competition uh, between China and the US about this land of Africa, I have my own opinion. They decide to look east. And now Kenya or Africa country will make a decision which one is better and which one I will take. And Kenya, like most of the continent, is choosing China for its big infrastructure projects. The Excellency, the President, will now proceed to view the board layout display. Last August, three African heads of state celebrated the Chinese-built expansion to the port of Mombasa. It will soon be linked to a Chinese-built railway connecting five East African countries. Your Excellencies, that is what our region needs. A railway for $3.5 billion connects into the port, builds ports. That's quite, that's quite the achievement for Africa and for China. There's ports already in every African country that has an ocean front. And those ports were built by another imperial power, one or another, in the last century. This is what imperial powers do. They build ports so that they can send their goods to that country and so that they can export from that country to their markets the things they need from that country. You don't think Africa needs that this kind of infrastructure anyway, at any rate? Africa desperately needs infrastructure. Whether it needs infrastructure on these terms is the question. They are negotiating many of these deals on the basis of a kind of barter, a secure supply of resources for a, a piece of infrastructure. That's a type of modern barter. Most people elsewhere are not doing that kind of trade or investment with Africa. The second thing that they are doing, which makes this arguably very far from a win-win situation, is China is creating these very powerful feedback loops for its own victory, its own win, that really cut Africa or African countries out of the equation in terms of the benefits. So the blueprints and engineering, no turnover, no, no handover. It's all Chinese. All Chinese. The workers, they send over 500 or 1,000 workers. They do this for two years. I've been on projects where even the people pushing wheelbarrows are Chinese. So what you're saying is that the loan is Chinese, the investment is Chinese, the plans are Chinese, the designs are Chinese, and the implementations and the workers are Chinese? Many times even the, the materials are Chinese. Oh, are they right? actually importing so the materials? Building, the salaries of the workers are typically, or at least very often, banked in China. So win-win is a propaganda slogan. It's not a, an accurate description of this sort of arrangement. Imperialism evolves. It's different from age to age. The circumstances change. What's, what doesn't change is the balance of power between the two parties yes. that are engaged in imperialism. The weaker and the stronger. The weaker and the stronger. And the, the weaker has an inability to resist or a lack of alternatives. Or to bargain. And that's exactly what we're talking about. I'm very skeptical about the whole Africa rising narrative. What uh, civilization can one reference that has ever been developed uh, by uh, foreigners? But you also seems to be creating a, an elite that are benefiting from all the investments, benefiting from the selling of the land, benefiting from the new security situation. I think the old word for that, uh, if you read your Franz Panon, is, is um, the comprador elite. This is not new, we just have um, um, a, new, a, new, a new class of elites. You have your kind of post-structural adjustment oligarchs and others, you know, who, who are now um, skimming off the top of these new deals. 
There are three ways of looking at Africa's so-called growth and prosperity. One is that it is real. The numbers prove it. Seven out of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. As a continent, Africa is growing at seven to 10% faster than any other continent in the world. The other way of looking at it is that this is fake, all fake. It's a false dawn. Africa's growth is fueled by debt and the mass sale of natural resources. And then there's a third scenario, which is, yes, Africa is growing. Yes, Africa is prospering. But who's benefiting? Africans and their majorities or only a few oligarchs, only the elite that is linked to global finance and global power. So which is it? And this is the question I need to take to the man in charge of industrializing Kenya, a former banker turned minister. You're a former banker. Correct. And you know what I'm talking about when I say that there is no real development going on in building any industrial infrastructure in the, in, in the continent or in the country. In fact, your low-tech manufacturing has dropped in terms of production and in terms of exports. And now you're importing a huge number of Chinese cheap products. Correct. China turned into the factory of the world where not only Africa but many you know, countries globally have moved their productions into China. This is now the perfect time for Africa to become what China was many years ago. But you're signing contracts that say 70% of the labor for all these projects is gonna be Chinese. Well, I mean, there are cases like that in different parts. It's not like, Most that, cases, it's not like that across Africa. There's no infrastructure project that Chinese do without it being put on a tender, international tender, people bid, and the most appropriate... And the Chinese win. Chinese win. So, that so is the that. nature of the open nature. But we know that even before the process starts, because they're providing the credit. They're the ones who are ready to do the barter. And they are ready to, un to, to underprice the rest, because they, are, they, they're, they have a long-term plan. There are things that you can do as a country, as government. And there are things that you need to do with support of private capital or, or, or foreign capital. We must make the grounds convenient and conducive for people to want to come and invest in Africa. But for the time being, this is all theory. Well, it, it, is, it is not theory. It's a plan that just needs to be executed. For most of us non-Africans, this is the exotic continent. Open skies, open horizon, natural beauty. Global powers have long projected their fantasies and fears on Africa. The continent represents expanding markets, cheap labor, and natural resources. On the other hand, it's the incubator of their worst nightmares. Instability, ethnic conflicts, and global terrorism. With the drawdowns in Iraq and Afghanistan, the US war on terror has pivoted to Africa. Last year, the U.S. Africa Command ran over 400 missions in more than 35 African nations. The U.S. is training, whipping, or running joint exercises with most of the militaries on the continent. The number two in Yukon, General Charles Walden, came out with a statement, the Sahara is a swamp which we must drain of terrorists. He talked of 30,000 terrorists having swarmed out of Afghanistan, through the Sudan, through Chad, through Niger, through Mali, up to Algeria. I've never found a trace of one has been on that route. Professor Jeremy Keenan has written five books about Africa and the war on terror. He argues that the threat of terrorism was initially greatly exaggerated, both by the US military and by African leaders. So you have these fairly dictatorial governments basically referring to any civil society movement that had any angst or complaint against the government. They were being branded as sort of terrorist. It's what I call terrorism rents. You're actually getting money off fabricating, creating terrorists. And of course your opposition 
uh, gets dubbed as, as terrorist. It is being described as a new front in the war on terror. What has happened in the last year or two is that it's got out of control. It is now becoming serious. It's become a self-fulfilled prophecy. Worldwide attention is growing over the Islamist militant group Boko Haram. What should we know? about al-shabaab al-qaeda in the maghreb which is this group has a safe a haven and training grounds for al-qaeda exactly what afghanistan was in the 1990s so now the global war on terror has come to africa and it's expanding from nigeria to kenya from algeria to uganda it's as if washington has recreated its school of the americas into a new school of africa one where under the rubric of African American advisors train African security forces to fight Washington's war on terror. So is the new military aid helping stabilize Africa? Or is it dragging the continent into a war that's not its own? We're in a very tough neighborhood in East Africa. And Kenya has always been something of a safe haven. If you were to present five years ago the idea that, that in five years' time, your country is going to be in a state of siege. Facing a constant threat of grenade attacks, bombings, or mass-scale killing. You would have told you that's impossible. The African intervention in Somalia especially, um, was predicated on the idea that uh, um, um, America was going to avoid embarrassment by putting its own boots on the ground so African boots could be put on the ground. Right. In other words, so, African So it lives. outsourced the war on terror to you? Yes, The absolutely. war on terror to you? Absolutely. So, and do you feel more secure now? Of course not. I mean, what are the implications of that? What are the implications? Well, what we are seeing in this country, in Kenya today, is... is um, a, a total backlash, blowback, really, uh, um, against against our presence in in Somalia. It feels sometimes, and in a lot of places, like we're we're in a state of siege. You like know? a state of siege. Yes. Barcelelo isn't alone in these feelings. Even the prime minister who first sent troops to Somalia has had a change of heart. He now finds himself in the opposition and is calling for a troop withdrawal. Prime Minister, have you enlisted in the U.S. war on terror in East Africa? Yes, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we are in the midst of the war on terror. It's something that circumstances has uh, imposed on us. And it started under you. You're the one who sent the troops to Somalia. Yes. We called it uh, Operation Linda Inchi, meaning that there's operation to protect the country. But don't you think occupation of Somalia generates more radicalism and extremism? I think so. That's why we must have a, an exit strategy. But you don't think the president is the Salim boy? Because he just declared a war on terror. Still uh, uh, in uh, a fighting mood. He's in a fighting mood. Yeah. <laughs> that does not bode well for the country. Because, uh, right. as you said, the continent is probably going to need more stability, not, not more war. Yeah, that's what we need more stability than, than war. Exactly. It's war on terror, war on terror. Oh now, it might, might have not reached Botswana yet, but yes. I think. Yes. 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 Kenya. Oh, yeah, you tell me Kenya. about this war on terror. Who is it helping? I mean, when, when they kept giving us military aid, it's keeping the current government in power. So you cry war on terror, you get aid, and you, you stay in power. And you stay in power. Are you saying that the, the new military solutions of training troops, putting money in new security structures, you think that yeah, no, does that's, help that's, 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 bring uh, that's, peace? That's, that's not help. All you're going to deal with them is to shoot them and kill them. You're not solving the problem. The fighting, I think, creates escalation. I think sometimes an eye for an eye. Right now, we did not invade Somalia just because we wanted to invade Somalia or because it's fun, right? Yeah, true. We yes. invaded Somalia because it was it destabilizing was Kenya. No, you know, it, yes. wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't fun at all. It was destabilizing. But it was destabilizing Kenya. Now, now, now I'm curious. Yeah. You actually think Kenya can stabilize Somalia? 
No, I don't think Kenya can stabilize Somalia. So why send the military in? Then? No, yeah. It's just to okay. make it look like it is Kenya to make the situation a bit better. A bit Give better. me one country uh -huh. that was stabilized using military intervention. Give me one country. Afghanistan. But I would Maybe Lebanon. 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 Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I, just, I don't believe the Kenya military was ever in Somalia to, to occupy Somalia. Exactly. It was to at least try to stabilize Somalia in as much as we can and then move out. It was yes, never an that issue. But that's why America is in Afghanistan. That's why America is in Iraq. No, 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 no. no. no Only no. to stabilize. No, no, no. no, no. Only to stabilize. We introduced democracy. It's time to democracy. We introduced democracy. It's perverse, even if it's predictable, that Washington would find its way back to Africa under the pretext of the global war on terror. Clearly, today's Africa security agenda is not set in Nairobi or Lagos. It's set in Washington. That's why we need to get to the American capital and speak to an AFRICOM strategist. Jennifer Cook is the director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. On the one hand, you want to fight extremism. On the other hand, you support military dictatorships or, or military regimes from, you know, Egypt to Nigeria. Well, this is a pattern for the U.S. all over the world. I mean, this is, it's not anything new in Africa. What is new in Africa is that we pay a lot more attention because we tend to think we have fewer interests in Africa. It's almost like the U.S. can have morals where it doesn't have interests, in a way. What are America's interests in Africa? Well, obviously there's the security agenda. There's a growing economic agenda as well. There's also the competition, I think, for political ideas and ideologies. You mean the scramble? With the Chinese and the French, and, yeah, I think, and I the think, Turks, and the, <laughs> yeah, I think and the there Iranians. there is there is a competition for global norms. We want to remain relevant and influential in Africa, um, and so I think that's where the game is going to be played. And that justifies the 1.2 billion extra now uh, investment in the in the military base in Djibouti. In uh, does it justify? Well. The problem is, in the U.S. system, the military is probably the best resourced right. tool that we have. If we had a limited budget, I would say we have to be very careful to balance that with the military. You can train a military in Mali to, you know, shoot straight and, and do the right thing. If the government that they work for is corrupt or weak, um, no amount of military training is going to fix that country's security problem. Or perhaps the contrary. When you support, train a corrupt military government, that could probably lead to even more disasters. Uh, yes, you, but you have to get the, the mix of both, I think. It's good to end in an, an agreement. <laughs> good grief. <laughs> when we come back, French troops on African soil, is this the return of the dark old days of France Afrique? We're dealing with a continent that has been doubly, maybe even triply wounded. It's just hours from direct combat with Al Qaeda fighters. France is involved now. Now the French are leading the well, fight. Well, I know it sort of uh, offends most American sensibilities. In fact, the most aggressive country fighting the jihad is France, if you can believe it. When France invaded Mali last year, it offended Fox News sensibilities to learn that people they once thought of as cheese-eating surrendering monkeys were now the frontline force in the war on terror in Africa. Here, in Paris, the news was hardly shocking. Many still think of Francophone Africa as their backyard. But it did mark a dramatic change in policy. A few years ago, it seemed that France's military was being relegated to the grand parades of the Champs-Élysées, that Paris was going to put its past behind it. No more wars, no more interventions, and certainly no more 
France Afrique, that corrupting system of patronage that governed France's relations with Africa. Time and again, in the early days of independence, popular African leaders were assassinated or deposed in coups led by ex-French foreign legionnaire. Togo in 1963, the Central African Republic in 1966, Burkina Faso also in 66, Mali in 1968. In 50 years of independence, there have been 16 coups in former French colonies, more than in all the other countries of Africa combined. All that violence kept in power governments that were in line with France's political interests and friendly to its oil and mining industry. The system of interlocking military, political, and economic influence is known as France-Afrique. Even today, many former colonies continue to struggle to free themselves from it. France holds the national reserves of 14 African countries in its central bank. It has a web of military bases across West Africa and paralleled by any other foreign power. And it exercises deep political and commercial influence on the continent. This has to change and this has to, to, to be ended. So at some point, we have to renegotiate the terms of France Africa. Do you think uh, this is going to be transformed anytime soon? Um, five, six years ago, you had some very strong anti-French rhetoric coming out of Francophone Africa. What's happened? Um, the actors who are speaking against France have been replaced. Like, who, like where? Well, for example, Ivory Coast, and where else? France militarily intervened to impose a pro-French ruler. Or in Mali, where Francois Hollande militarily intervened, suppressing a popular indigenous movement in the north to impose a southern leader through what you could barely call real elections. And that southern leader now, Ibe Kai, is a servant of France in Niger, where uh, Mohamedou Isofou, uh, uh, who is a former employee of the French uranium country, Arriva, is now the president of Niger and recently signed a 40-year concession, giving away Niger's only non-renewable natural resource, uranium. This is an exhausting list. Is he being harsh? Yes, I think so, quite a bit. Uh, I was not supposed to be, uh, to be the French lady on stage, yeah? but no, I, please, I have please. to. Please, uh, please. Otherwise, yeah. I'm going to have to <laughs> be the French lady on stage. <laughs> lady. That would be dreadful. Yeah. Uh, I discussed with uh, an American uh, diplomat, say, OK, French-speaking countries, your history, your stuff. Tirez les, Angl Tirez les premiers, monsieur les Anglais, quoi. Enfin, monsieur les Français, en l'occurrence. How do you translate in the English? Shoot first. Uh, dear French people. <laughs> a, a text that is written by President Hollande and President Obama, published in the Washington Post, about the deep, important, strategic relationship between the United States and France, especially in Africa. Hmm. What is this relationship that suddenly has become so important, and why is it there? Well, each of these partners has something to offer in this region that's being called Afghanistan. The United States, what does it have to offer? It has money, it has military hardware, things like drones, satellite information. It has high-tech capacity. What does France have to offer? Boots on the ground and intelligence. The one thing the United States can't get in French-speaking Africa, because it simply doesn't have the language. The businesses are competing for their strategic resources, but the governments are collaborating in the war on terror. But are they now finding that the bigger threat is not amongst themselves, but China, economically speaking? Economically speaking, uh, everybody um, acknowledge the power of China and say, OK, we can compete. They're just there. And uh, no, we have to, uh, we have to reorganize to find, um, to find new ways to, to make uh, business, uh, new ways to make diplomacy so that we can, that we can keep uh, some influence. And France Afrique helps in this sense. We speak a lot uh, about the, the military intervention, but we don't speak about uh, Francon 40, for, for instance. Ten years from now, the biggest French speaking city uh, in the world will be Kinshasa. So it's something very, very, very important. Uh, the cultural entrenchment in Africa is an asset 
for Paris. Yes, and uh, we, we aim to use it um, strategically. And so in that sense, France and the U.S. are getting involved to perhaps confront or contrast with the Chinese involvement? Just to keep uh, their share. Uh, so this is it. It's dividing the pie. We are uh, all uh, doing the same things, same mistakes we were doing during the colonization. Dividing areas of influences within Africa. Yeah, that, that's the, the risk we are, uh, that, that is at stake. Yes. At stake. You know, it's puzzling to me that the same France that condemned the American-British invasion of Iraq would be so in denial over its own military interventions in Africa. Now, here you have a country that is capable of debating anything from the smell of cheese to France's rightful place in Europe. But it's incapable of having a frank discussion over its present and past relationship with Africa. As if, for France, Africa is the place where truth goes to sleep. What is more peculiar is France's anti-imperialist socialist left that is no less in denial over France's imperialism in Africa. So how do you feel now about France enlisting in America's war on terrorism in Africa? I don't like this relation and not even this formulation. I am afraid of the taste of the Americans for our violence, and in a way afraid too of their youth, China, Britain, France, are thousand years old countries, a long historic experience. We are still ashamed of our last colonial wars. We have finished with all that. We have no more any strategic interest in Africa. But now Francois Hollande wants to double the trade from 30 billion to 60 billion dollars. How do you double the trade? I... You are strange. You have a strange way to question. Francois would like to double the trade of France with the whole world. But the problem is in Africa you have in, involved in four wars while you are talking about trade. You like to mix the the question at once? Okay. They are mixed. The French reaction is the duty left by history it puts on us an obligation to go there, even if alone. You cannot rub out history, it's not my fault. Mm. France is a force, let's call it a force of stability in Africa, meaning Africans look to France, it has 10,000 soldiers, it has multiple bases, and it involves in war, in, in intelligence on the continent. So it's normal for them to preference France for their trade because France is a power in Africa. Maybe for them. In my vision, we are fed up with all that. I would have preferred not to have to go to Mali, not to have to center Africa, but take Mali. They call for help. No one was ready. America was too busy with uh, Iraq, where she, they should never have been, but they are. Anyway, we helped to destroy the killers. It was a two-month operation. For the rest, it's their affair. But you're staying there in Mali. You're not leaving Mali. Even after the UN comes. I am as sad as you are that all these Muslims between themselves are not capable to find ways to speak and to reconstruct friendship. All the new murderous groups, the religiously motivated religious groups, yep. have all of them come out of result of foreign intervention. Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, ISIS in Iraq, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Palestine, Shabab in Somalia, etc., etc. Every time there is a foreign military intervention, it creates radical, extremist, violent groups. Aren't you doing the same thing in Sahel today? I'm not sure you're right. You may be. It's factual. I don't permit you to take so quick conclusions. It's another conversation. Are you trying to if bring... there is mm. 
a terrorist zone in Central Africa. It will be, first of all, a worry for all of you. Muslim people are those who live there. The better you manage without calling for us is the best. Up to you to treat the problem. Mm -hmm. You will not draw me. Mm -hmm. You will not draw France backwards to colonialism. Mm -hmm. Listening to the Chinese and the Americans and the French, you would think they're all out there to help Africans help themselves, as they say. The French want to help Africans build democratic institutions. The Americans want to help Africans build security structures, and the Chinese want to help them build the economic infrastructure. But the big question is, are Africans benefiting from the new competition, or are they being squeezed by this new scramble? The Chinese, if I used American words, are living their dream. The Western countries are living their dreams. Africans are being forced to live other people's dreams. So in this you mean you mean Africa is living the China dream? No, we've been living the Western country dreams. Right. And now China is here with its dream. It's yet to be clear whether Africa will live its own dream. We need to distinguish um, what the African agenda is. You know, um, it's it's become very fashionable for African governments to talk about um, a new policy of looking east. Um, the question for me is whether um, they are looking east or whether the Chinese are looking to Africa. So the question of what the African agenda is, is a very important one. Now, if you look at the... But, but, but are Africans benefiting from the Chinese in engagements in Africa? Yes. On the one hand, uh, um, um, you, there's, there, there is an unequivocal yes. African governments are now free, have now been freed to um, actually make deals on terms that are that they can live with. So, so, the, so the Chinese engagement is a step forward from the European and Western one? In the terms in which it, it is, it is um, um, creating opportunities for, for African governments to begin uh, uh, dreaming about um, a, new, a new infrastructure of modernization aid. We should not forget that uh, when Western countries were also coming to Africa, they, they also looked uh, friendly. Uh, they also came in the name of trade. Uh, they came even with infrastructure. In fact, the British uh, built uh, the Uganda, the Kenya-Uganda Railway. And in at that early stage, they were not talking about their colonizing anybody, you know? How the Africans reacted at that time so, uh, looks so similar to how Africans are reacting to China now, you know, in terms of their odd with these good things that are coming, but they don't have a game. What is critical is to pinpoint an African game or an African agenda in the absence of which uh, it is, becomes very difficult to celebrate any kind of uh, achievement in the absence of a goal in mind. I'm constantly puzzled about the fact that there hasn't been um, um, an internal debate on this continent about what we want to do with the Chinese. The Chinese are constantly having these conferences and you know, inviting Africans, uh, um, you know, African governments um, 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 for, for these debates. But Africans, ourselves, whether uh, on a regional level, at, at, an, at, at an African Union level, um, we have not actually had this debate. These are questions that need to be asked. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical that, that Africa has the leadership, that has the leverage, that has the unity and the coordination to do any of this. We have to understand that we're dealing with a continent that is still, is, has been doubly, maybe even triply wounded, you know, over the past 50 years. You know, the sense, the sense of purpose that was, was driving the kind of um, immediate post-independence generation um, of, of uh, nationalists, you know, the whole independence dream for the continent, that's almost completely gone. I mean, you barely, you, you, have, you have the rhetoric, mm. you know, you have the rhetoric uh, uh, um, um, of it uh, being bandied around, but the meaning has been totally excavated How from, is that and from why? the mission. For different reasons. I mean, the kind of um, 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 wars that were waged here, either proxy wars during the Cold War or else just mm -hmm. civil wars, uh, um, you know, over the last 40, 50 years. Or today, war on terror. Today, the war on terror, but also 
Um, just, just, just as uh, uh, much as uh, um, military and civil conflicts um, has been the kind of economic war or the war on economic policy that has been waged here. Economic policy has been externalized um, in a profound way. But, but it does have African, and the implications, African agents. There's an African agency. There that. is. There, there are African boots on ground, boots on the ground. You know, at, at you know, at various treasuries. Uh, um, but the policies themselves are um, um, fundamentally neoliberal and are fundamentally uh, pursuing a line that was uh, developed by the West. But that, that includes right. both the Chinese and the competition between the Chinese and the rest. I mean, that has not changed that game in Africa. Yes, but the terms. It's more important to, to um, explore the terms on which these engage, you know, an engagement with the Chinese is possible. You know, in a, in a post in a post structural adjustment era, in a neoliberal age, um, how do you begin to negotiate uh, um, your goods and services, your resources? You're constantly going to be pursuing outsourcing mm -hmm. kinds of uh, projects, projects, projects that will privilege private capital and the privatization of collective resources and public goods. But that know? doesn't sound like development to me. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of things doesn't sound like development. Yeah. But for me, awareness is a good step. Uh, to first of all, be aware that you are not playing your own game. You're playing somebody else's game. Mm. It's a good step now to craft your own game. And in terms of uh, the issues of trade, you know, if we are not sitting down to think long term, uh, then you know you're opening doors and benefiting short term and then eventually your country or continent loses in the long term. So I think the, the, the issue of how to reverse this trend is really on our side as Africans to ask ourselves when we talk about industries, who is running the industries in Africa? We are, we are a continent that is emerging you know, uh, uh, from a, an era of intellectual surrender, intellectual policy surrender. You know, where your entire economic outlook and orientation was externalized. What is so encouraging, especially for, you know, for political elites about China, is that uh, we are freed from the conditionality regime mm. that governed this continent for so long. You know, it's, there's a little bit of policy petulance, if I may call it that, uh, amongst, you know, amongst the elite at the moment, to, uh, saying to the West that we no longer need you we, you, you can see, we now have China. I actually read right. in the local press a long expose about the rise of the African oligarchs. Do you agree with that? Uh, we are in that state now, 50 years down the line, uh, because uh, we look at even how the political leadership changes, uh, where the word change does not really mean the dictionary aspect, because it's the same group that keeps uh, recycling itself. Right. And, and uh, holding the door on behalf of the country right. or on behalf of the region of the continent. It's interesting to me when we talk about oligarchs because the oligarchs are actually a natural historical outcome of the privatization of public resources. Changing the face of, 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 you know, of the so-called investor you know, from, from an American or a Chinese or an Indian to an African face you know, doesn't change the nature of, of, of um, the kind of exploitative, extractive policies that, that, that uh, um, um, are already in motion. What you actually require is to totally reverse or transform um, um, the nature of the game. generational thing because like our grandparents or per se were you know dealing with the colonialists literally so it was let's let's take in all this information and let's do it as they have told us our parents generation is more or less let's imitate the West and that's the problem because the Western ways don't necessarily work for Africa that's not what Africa needs but I feel like our generation is taking a step forward I think part of the problem is people thinking there's no hope there's no room for change and that's that's an old thinking so we need to flush out the old you know, and encourage the new, encourage the new but ways I, of thinking and bring that I forward. But the question is, no, now that you have multiple global corporations and
powers, interests in Africa, is that giving you more room to maneuver and to get better deals, or is that sandwiching you in no, among think, various think, interests? One thing, one thing also we should realize is most of most of the time Africans we negotiate as single entities. Yeah. With, yeah. If Europe is negotiating, you see the European Union, you Europe see Europe. the United yeah, States yeah. of Africa, you see China as a very global major power, but Africa we go as Ghana. You go as Sierra Leone, you go as Nigeria. You don't have bargaining power. Yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. simple economics. Your bargaining power is not strength. We need, we need to negotiate as a blog. And I see African Capacity Building Foundation, African Development Bank, they should really try and maybe think about ways of we going as speaking with one voice. That's the but only way we can we, vote. We it takes a movement. It takes a number of people getting into the system and changing the system from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, as individuals, you go and you're fought by the system and you get caught in the system and you're, you're, you become redundant. I don't want to be in the you know, non-governmental organization. I want to be in the government. The government has the last say. The government has the last say on how much tax you pay you know, I agree. in the private sector. In the, so and when you go to these meetings and you listen to what the government officials have to say and you're wondering, oh my god, is this the best we've got? Yeah. Because as much of intellectual capacity, they don't have so much. They never demand for anything. Like, so it doesn't have to be just NGOs yeah, or have. business. Yeah. Yeah. People need to get into the decision making yeah, process they need to, and change they government. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, we have the young generation <laughs> <laughs> change it. No, no, we are the young generation. Yeah. We, we will change, change it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm not buying into this whole French, Chinese, American argument that they're in the continent to help Africans help themselves. You know, we at Empire, we take it for granted that global powers act out of self-interest. But what's been striking for me making this episode is the dynamism and determination of African youth. Those who make up 70% of the continent's population, their political maturity has been striking to me. They have this pan-African vision that makes it indispensable for African countries and peoples to work together in order to turn the tables on those who are trying to carve the continent into pieces. Cliché, perhaps. Simple, yes. But I say, brilliant.